and it's my privilege to be able to meet with you now, open God's word, read it and see what he has to say with us. Wherever you are in the world, I trust you'll be blessed by what God has to say to you. I'm going to read to you from Mark's gospel and the eighth chapter, Mark chapter eight, and just a few verses beginning at verse 34. It says this, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory with his Father's holy angels. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that in your mercy you would help us to understand what you're saying to us in these words. Such important words. Such valuable words. You said your word is the word of life. Oh, we pray that it would be that to us as we explore it and feed on it now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're only going to focus on two of the verses here. That's not a lot of the Bible, just a small chunk. But it's not an insignificant chunk. In fact, what you're going to hear now is going to change your life. And it's going to change your life forever. Even if you get to the end of listening and you feel no different to how you do right now, things have changed. Because these couple of verses come into our lives like a thief, like a robber, and steal from us any excuse that we might have, any excuse that you might have for not being a Christian. You'll never be able to complain that you didn't know that you needed to be saved. And if you turn up at the judgment, facing God, still in your sin, looking at eternity in hell, you'll have nobody to blame but yourself. The great English Puritan preacher John Bunyan, when he preached this passage, he told the people who came to hear him week after week, by explaining this text, I deliver myself from any responsibility for your damnation. That's what he told these people. He said, I I'm setting the truth before you. If you refuse to believe it, then you bear the consequences. I say the same thing to you tonight, the, the words that we're looking at here. If you refuse to believe them, if you reject them, turn away from them, it it's on your own head. And you must face the consequences of that one day. Maybe you'd say, well, it was Jesus himself who put me off Christianity. It's things like this where he says, uh, you know, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross. He makes being a Christian sound really hard. And, and that's true. It is. But now the Lord Jesus continues to explain why losing this life to save your soul is actually the greatest bargain of all. I want you to see four simple things. I'm going to make four simple statements from this text. The first is this. You have a soul. Now that needs to be a point because there are many people living in the world today who don't want to believe that. They know that admitting having a soul means admitting that there's a spiritual element to life. It would be opening a, a door to a world that science and philosophy insists isn't real. But I'm going to give you a couple of bits of evidence. Number one, the Bible says you have a soul. The Bible makes this great foundational claim that you are not just a body, but you have a soul. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. And so we are made from dust, just like the animals are made from dust. And so we see similarities between animals and humans. But then, after forming man's body, God did something totally unique for man. Genesis carries on, it says, He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, 
and man became a living being. You see, Adam, the first man, he wasn't finished when God had made his body. Even though everything was there, his blood, his bones, his organs, his nerves, he wasn't a man until God came close and breathed life into Adam. That's what makes a man, a body and a soul. Now let me present two bits of evidence that back this up from our experience. Number one, life confirms that we have a soul. Life, that's a pretty huge chunk of evidence, isn't it? But life itself confirms that you have a soul. There are things that you do every single day that no animal can do. Because you're not just a body like a, a rat or a mosquito. You can ponder, think about profound truths. You can discuss and communicate complicated ideas. You can love deeply. And you can make costly sacrifices for others. You know that in the early 1900s, the famous cruise ship, the Titanic, was sunk on its way to America. When that happened, when the ship was sinking into the icy cold waters, many of the fathers and the husbands on the ship made the conscious decision that they would drown in the freezing water so that their wives and their children could escape. Do you think deer would have done that? That the stags would have stepped back and said, don't worry lads, we should just suffer ourselves and let the does and the fawns escape. No way. When the forest is on fire, they all flee. And the slow are left behind. You're not like the animals. God has breathed something of his own life into you. You've got eternity in your heart. The Bible says that. We've got eternity in our hearts. You've got a conscience that, that twitches and, and squirms when we hurt somebody or do something that we know is wrong. Science can't explain it. It's something that, that doesn't belong in this world living in you. So life shows us that we've got souls. But secondly, death confirms that you have a soul. When I first became the, the pastor of the church here, after a, a couple of years, one of our leader's wives died. She had cancer. And she was a, a lovely, vibrant Christian lady. She was only in her 50s when she died. And when she died, I went to visit the, the family who'd been caring for this lady at home for a number of weeks before she, before she died. When I went to visit the family, her body was still there in the living room, which is unusual for uh, a Western culture. The body's usually in a hospital when the lady dies, but she'd been cared for at home. And so her body was there. It was lying in exactly the same place that she'd been lying in the previous days when I'd been up to visit her and, and read the Bible with her and pray with her. But this time, what was different was there was this heavy awareness that this lady who I loved and who the family loved, she was gone. And even though her body was right there, it wasn't Jane. That was the lady's name. It wasn't her. And maybe you felt the same way. You've been to a funeral or you've been near the dead body of somebody that you've loved very much. It's inches away, that body. But the person is gone. Maybe you, you drive through a town and you see a house where all the windows are boarded up or some of them are broken and the, the grass outside is overgrown. And you look at that house and you say, well, there's nobody living there. That's what it feels like to see the dead body of somebody that you love. It's vacant. There's nobody living there. The building is there, but there's nobody home. Each of us has a body and a soul. The second simple statement I want to make from these two verses is that your soul is immensely valuable. Statement number one, you have a soul. Statement number two, that soul is immensely valuable. It's said today of us folks in the Western world that we know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And when we're asked, what's a soul worth? We might be tempted to, to try and put a price on it, to guess 
what a soul could be worth in a, in a monetary value. People joke together. Oh, I'd, I'd sell my soul if only I could have that car or if I could have her good looks or if I could have that person's popularity or their sporting ability. But you look at what the Lord Jesus, the expert Jesus says. He knows what a soul is worth and he shows us with a, a powerful demonstration. Verse 36. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What can a man give in return for his soul? It's as if the Lord Jesus takes out this giant set of scales like balances that people used to weigh things in. And he puts it in front of us and on one side he puts everything in the world. Can you imagine that? Everything is there. All of the world's money goes on that side. All of the gold and the silver and the diamonds and the rubies. All of the world's knowledge is piled on next. All of the books and the libraries and the universities and every Wikipedia article and every web page. It all gets piled on and piled on. And then all of the businesses and the huge factories across the world and the great business empires and the monopolies and the industry and the cities and the towns, all of the world's beauty. He piles it up. Nothing's left out. The Himalayan mountains, they go on that side of the scale. All of the beauty that we get to enjoy here in New Zealand, it gets put there. The jungles, the deserts, the steaming rainforests, the tropical islands, every car, every boat, every private jet, every machine, everything that the boys look at and think, wow, I wish I had that. All of the beautiful bodies from the magazine covers, all of the fame and the sex and the popularity and the strength and everything and everyone that we are told every day that we should admire, Jesus leaves nothing out. He puts it all on that side of the scale. In fact, the words in the original language here for whole world are holon cosmon, meaning literally the entire cosmos. And so every planet in our galaxy is on that side of the scale. Every star, every comet, every moon, every supernova, it's all placed on that side of the scale. And it piles up and up. And so everything in the cosmos is there. And we look at it and we say nothing could ever lift that. And then on the other side of the scale, Jesus places a single soul. Just one. And it might be the soul of a man with learning difficulties or the soul of a, a North Korean peasant woman who swept the same street every day of her life. But as soon as that soul touches the scale, as soon as it goes on, slam! Down it goes. It doesn't wobble for a second. There's no doubt about what's worth more. What's more valuable? The single soul outweighs everything in the world. My friend, you have got something. Because you've got a soul. You have got something that is more valuable than everything this world has. There are things that you love. There are things that you treasure. Things that you can't imagine being without. But none of it compares to the value of your soul. The third simple statement that I want to make is quite frightening in light of that one. Statement number three. Anyone can lose their soul. You have a soul. Your soul is incredibly valuable. Number three, anyone can lose their soul. Some people murder their soul with, with bad living. So you fill your mind with the worst kinds of conversation and TV shows and websites. Some people fill their, their bodies with alcohol and drugs, their, their conversation with, with sex and lies and, and greed. They harden the heart and strangle the soul. Some people destroy their souls with bad thinking. And so you invest your mind in false religions. 
in, in the new age, in, in cults and theories that don't have any time, any system of belief that has no time for Jesus, the one saviour of souls. Those things will blind you to your soul's one chance of escaping hell. But do you know the most common way for people to lose their souls? The way that millions of people around the world right now are losing their souls is actually by doing nothing. You imagine somebody buys a famous painting and they spend an obscene amount of money on this painting and because it's so expensive and such a famous painting the, the local news crew come down when the painting is delivered to the man's house and the van arrives and the, the painting is bought out of the back of the van and it's all covered over in protective wrapping. And the man peels off the paper and the painting is revealed and everybody goes, wow, that is a beautiful painting. And the next question they've got is, I wonder where he's going to put it. If he spent that much on that painting, surely he's got a special room with the ideal lighting to show off the painting, somewhere where you can sit with a, an expensive, comfortable chair and just enjoy this painting. And so the news crew follows the man as he takes the painting out of the van and walks towards his house, but then turns off and goes into the garden, walks to the shed at the bottom of his garden, opens the door, slides the painting in, closes the door and goes back into the house. Well, that night uh, the painting is stolen and nobody's surprised. And everybody says, what a stupid man for not keeping such a precious thing safe. You've got a body and you do everything you can to look after it. You search it for lumps. You keep eyes on you keep an eye on suspicious moles. You go to the doctor when there's pain. You care for your body. You wash your hair every day. You, you, you make sure you're clean. But what have you done for your precious soul? What measures have you taken to make sure that your eternally precious soul is not lost forever? You lock your car. You lock your front door. You put a camera over the door to your house. You shield your PIN number when you buy something with your credit card. But what have you done to secure your soul? You protect these things that are precious and valuable, but what about your soul? All you have to do to lose it is nothing. Just daydream. Think about something else while I try and wake you up to the value of your soul. Think about your afternoon or your evening and what you're going to do. Think about the, the football game that's coming up at the weekend. It's all you have to do. Go with the flow along the broad road to hell. And soon the opportunity of saving your soul is gone forever. For wide is the gate, said the Lord Jesus. And broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few finding it even finding the entrance to the road that leads to life takes effort you do nothing you lose your precious soul forever my fourth and final simple statement from this text you have a soul, that soul is incredibly precious. Anyone can lose their soul. Number four, but anyone's soul can be saved. I've got a friend who has a little orchard, some beautiful apple trees, and she went out one day and picked out the most juicy, ripe looking apple that she could find and she polished it against her apron and she was just about to bite into it when she noticed one little hole in the top and so she took out her knife and she cut open the apple 
and inside the whole fruit was rotten because one little worm had made its way inside. You can't save your soul. You can try your best to be a respectable or a religious person. You could be very well behaved. You could do all the things that the people around you think you should do. You could do all the things that your mum and dad or your wife or, or your family members think you should do to get into heaven. But our big problem is not our behavior. See, the things that we do wrong, they are only symptoms of an internal problem. They're the outward symptoms of an internal problem. We're not sinners because we sin. But we sin because we are sinners. We're born with the worm of sin eating away at our hearts, chewing us up, making our lives foul and repulsive to God. Now we can take the apple, we can polish it up, we can make ourselves look good on the outside, we can do all the good things that people think are good, but it's still the inside that's the problem. That's why Jesus says, verse 35, if you try and save yourself, you will lose forever. Because God looks at the inside. Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. And our hearts are rotten. And God's not going to take our rotten souls into heaven. We'll be left to eternity in hell. But the Lord Jesus also said, if you will lose your life, if you will give up trying to save yourself, give up relying on your religion to rescue you and put your life in His hands, rely on Him and His work, not your work, to save you. You will save your soul. See the Lord Jesus, His soul had no worm of sin eating the inside. He was perfect. But when He died on the cross, God treated Jesus, treated His body and His soul like my body and my soul and your body and your soul deserve to be treated. He gave Jesus my rotten soul and He suffered my hell. And he paid the price on the cross for my sin. And in place of my ruined soul, God gives me Jesus' perfect one. A clean, pure soul that meets his standard for heaven. That doesn't care about what my friends want, my friends' standards for heaven. The only person whose standards matter when it comes to heaven is God's. And Jesus' perfection is enough to meet the perfect standard God expects for heaven. What do you need to do then to save your eternal soul? There was a famous Syrian general named Naaman, General Naaman, who believed that saving his body from leprosy would take an incredible heroic act. He would need to do something brave and daring. We read about this man in the book of 2 Kings and chapter 5. Naaman was convinced that in order to rescue his body from leprosy, God would need him to do some brave heroic act. But no, that's not what God said. God said, I want you to go and wash in a dirty river seven times. Now, Naaman was so upset about this, it seemed so simple that he nearly didn't do it. He almost left Israel and went all the way back to Assyria and said, no, I'm not doing it. It's too easy. What's it going to take to save your soul? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What's got to happen for your soul to be saved? You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Turn from your sin. Turn from yourself and believe on Jesus. If you do nothing, you will lose that soul. But you believe. You trust your life, your death, your eternity to Christ and, and save your soul forever. And you'd say, but that's too easy. It costs too little. How can this gospel, this message be worth anything? Oh, it costs you nothing, but only because it costs God everything. God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, what it cost God to save you. He gave His darling Son 
His only beloved Son, Jesus, and nailed Him to a cross so that you and I could be saved. My friend, wherever you're sat, wherever you're listening, you're faced with a stark reality. You have something that is more precious than anything the world has to offer. And you could lose it forever. Jesus alone can save you. What are you going to do? There was a mighty emperor of France called Charlemagne. His name in French is made up of the words Charles, Charles and Le Magne, which means the great, Charles the Great. He got that title because he was loved by his people. He had everything that the world admires. He had money, he had power, he had popularity. Two centuries, 200 years after Charlemagne died, a new emperor named Otto went into Charlemagne's grave, into his tomb. And he opened up the tomb and there he found Charlemagne had been buried, sat upright on a throne with a golden crown on his head. And on his lap was open a Bible. And it was open to the Gospel of Mark and a bony old finger was resting on these words. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? Charlemagne achieved every goal of wealth, fame and glory on earth. But he knew that these things are temporary. None of it compared to the value of his soul. None of it compared to the value of knowing Jesus who can save you from the most terrible loss. Let's pray. Mighty Father, we pray that you would work by your Holy Spirit to draw people to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Help us to see the value of our soul Help us to see our value in your eyes and then run to the Lord Jesus in belief that he is our only way of being saved. It's not who we are. It's not what we do that can save us. As if we could ever be good enough for a perfect God. No, we need help outside of ourselves. We need you to rescue us, to give us the righteousness, the goodness that we could never earn. We thank you that you've done that in sending Jesus for us. We pray then that you'd help each of us who are listening to believe that. Give us the faith that we need to turn from our sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.